to set apart Pastor Lance Cruz with you tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. May God bless you. I hope these lessons have blessed you tremendously. They have made a major impact on my life and on my heart, my soul. They have, it's just been wonderful, guys. I can't believe we're already on lesson number seven. We're gonna be talking about lesson seven tonight and we're gonna talk about worship. We're going to be studying the life of King Hezekiah. And maybe you don't know much about King Hezekiah, and I don't have a lot of time to get in on all, all of his life and everything that he'd done. I'm going to just kind of skim over a little bit. I want you to encourage you to go back and read on his um, happenings of what all he'd done in the book of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles as well. And uh, just jot down some of the scripture that I, I mention or the text that I take. And you can go back and study that later and study his whole lifespan in a nutshell in those chapters, okay? <clears throat> so let's get started off right. Let's start out in prayer. We just appreciate you tuning in to these. They've been so wonderful. Lord willing, we've only got a couple more of these lessons left. And I'm already working on another series maybe to do with you guys. And I'm uh, just so excited about how the Word of God has just been so so awesome to me in my study and i just appreciate the lord tonight and i worship him and i thank him but i thank you for tuning in as well thank you for studying along with me thank you for being a part thank you for our faithful followers the the viewers the ones that tune in you've got your bibles open you're with me in the word of god it just means so much to me as a pastor and i love you guys so much thank you for tuning in god bless you let's open up in prayer okay a quick reminder for before I open up in prayer, we will be having in-person services this Sunday at Welcome Church at 10 a.m. and at 6.30 p.m., okay, guys? So we'll be having morning and evening services. Also at 10 a.m., we will be having Children's Church this Sunday. You'll drop your children off at the Kirkman Educational Building, and they will be there for the whole duration of the service. And after I dismiss you out of service, out of the sanctuary, You'll go over there and we'll uh, uh, key into them to bring your child out to you at the doorway and we'll bring them out one by one. They, in, that, in that Kirkman building, they'll all be spread apart. I've instructed our, our leaders of that over there, Sister Evie and Sister Sarah. They're going to do a great job with your children. They're going to keep the kids apart and maintain social distance when they're in there. So uh, bring your children out to Children's Church. I know they love to be there. Sister Evie and Sister Sarah looking forward to seeing them this Sunday morning. Again, I want to remind you as well, we're practicing, uh, practicing social distancing. Uh, we're not requiring masks at this time, but we, they are optional. I do prefer that when you're walking to your seat or getting up to leave or going to the restroom that you do put on a face covering. Uh, and uh, we ask people to refrain from uh, congregating in the foyer and around in the, the sanctuary as well. Uh, we still have the vulnerable section, which is to your right as you walk in, and it, they're all spread apart, and that's for our people with health conditions and our elderly folk, okay? So we're trying to do everything we can during this pandemic and this issue and this crisis we've been facing, and uh, God's really been blessing us. This Sunday will make the seventh week that we've been back opened up at Welcome Church, and we're just thankful that God's watched over our people, amen, and 
We, we love you guys so much. Let's open up in prayer. Okay, remember all these announcements. And may God bless you. Let's pray about this lesson. Okay, let's dive into it. I hope you're ready for it. I am too. Father, we just love you today. We thank you so much for your word and how powerful it is to us. I'm like the psalmist said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'm going to hide it in my heart that I might not sin against you, O God. Your, your word will light up the way for me. And I pray that you'd light the way for our, our viewers tonight, God, that are tuning in. Bless, God, our church people. Bless those that watch abroad, God. Touch them in a mighty way. We love you, and I humbly ask for your anointing to teach your precious gospel at this time, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I ask all this. Everybody said amen with me. All right, guys, let's dive in. I'm going to be taking our text tonight out of the book of 2 Kings, okay? 2 Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 1. 2 Kings 18, verse number 1. That's one of your key chapters to study, 2 Kings 18 and on through Hezekiah's lifespan, okay? And the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. 25 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah, and, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's key about Hezekiah, guys. A lot of kings, you'll see where it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Very rare you would find one that did right in the sight of the, of the Lord. But Hezekiah did according to all that David, his father, did. Now, David weren't necessarily his father, but he was a descendant of David, claiming uh, that he's of that lineage of King David, okay? He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Wow, let me just stop right there. What a testimony Hezekiah's got, right? Number one, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Man, what a testimony to have from, from the Word of God here about your life. I hope we can have that testimony, man, that God, we trusted in God so much that nobody ever trusted God like this before or after. Man, that's awesome. And verse number 6 of 2 Kings 18 says, For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments with the, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. And he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. So we find here in King Hezekiah's life, we're going to talk about being set apart by worship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, King Hezekiah was set apart by worship for this, this very reason that he put God number one. He lived a life devoted to his king, which was the Lord God of Israel. He saw how things in, in his time frame, which he was going to be, be king over, over Judah here, he saw how the people were steeped in idolatry and they were serving other gods and they're surrounded by the Assyrians. I mean, troubles on every side. He's saying there's got to be something better than this. But I want, we want to focus our attention on how he worshiped God and how God blessed him for that worship and that devotion unto him. Amen? So, in this week's study, King Hezekiah, we're going to see just how God will set us apart by when we worship Him and Him alone, and by worshiping Him exclusively, okay? We have to know that the Lord will be second to none when it comes to serving Him. God cannot be secondary. He cannot be third on, on your rank of, of who's important to you. God must be number one. This is the worship that God is looking for. Just want to point out a few things here real quick before we dive into our main points. Hezekiah's name means this, strengthened by the Lord. Man, I just want to throw this out. I feel a preacher rising up in me already. That when you worship God and worship Him exclusively, and He's your all in all and you're everything, and He is number one, and you seek first the kingdom of God, and after His righteousness, amen, like Matthew 6, 33 says, 
He, amen, my goodness, God blesses you and he will strengthen you that no matter what hell comes around you and no matter what hell assails you, no matter how the, 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 what the devil's up to and what's going on in this world, God will strengthen his true worshipers. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So Hezekiah's name means strengthened by the Lord. He was strengthened because he put God first. He was strengthened because he worshiped the Lord God of Israel and did not put no other gods before God Jehovah. So when proper worship goes up, then strength comes down from the Lord. It don't get no easier than that, guys, okay? Um, so, man, Israel's dealing with idolatry right here so bad. And, and I'm telling you, God hates idolatry. God can't stand it. It's like a spit in the face at God. It's an abomination to him to serve another God, but the, the, the one true living God, the only God that created us. It's just like a spit in the face to God. So idol worship here, let me just summarize this, what idol worship, where we're going with this. Idol worship or the worship of a false god is substituting or supplementing anything for God's place in our lives. Not only, uh, not only does it uh, turn us away from God, who is our help, but also turns us towards things that are inadequate and that will ultimately leave us empty, guys. Idolatry will leave you empty every time and it will not fill the void that's deep down inside of you that only your maker, amen, only your creator could fill, amen. So I want to start out with Hezekiah here and just point out a few points. I really, really want you to go back and read these chapters about Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18 on for the next couple of chapters through there, all the way to 2 Kings, you know, 20. And you could go back in Chronicles, and it talks about the life of Hezekiah starting in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and chapter 30 is really where you need to hone in on, okay, guys? So if you haven't studied much about King Hezekiah, please Go back and read it, okay, so you can really get the goody out of this lesson and maybe come and re-watch this lesson so you can get the meat out of what I'm going to throw at you, okay? Because it's all based on his life here, okay? Um, no more status quo worship. Hezekiah, he wasn't, he wasn't thrilled about the status quo worship of his day um, and what was transpiring in the nation of Israel. Let, let me let me read read this to you in 2 Kings chapter number 16, verse number 2 through 4, I believe is what I have here. Yes. 2 Kings 16, 2 through 4. Now this is talking about his daddy, okay, the king that was before him. Hezekiah took the place of his daddy. It says, 20 years old was Ahaz, that's his daddy, former king of Judah, when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God like David his father. Totally different testimony than his son, King Hezekiah, right? This is Hezekiah's daddy. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. They were steeped in idolatry back then in the northern kingdom of Israel. Yea, uh, and he made his sons to pass through the fire. He'd offer his children up to a false god named Molech. That's what they did in that time frame back then. And, and, and it says that, that according to the abominations of the heathen, that's who he walked after, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Man, this man's doing all the wrong things when it comes to serving the God of Israel and, and, and the God, the one true living God. We are to worship the Lord, guys, as Jesus said to the woman at the well of Sychar in John chapter number four. We're to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. He said the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. No matter what the status quo is, no matter what everybody else is doing, no matter what the, the northern kingdom of Israel is doing, no matter what daddy and mama used to do or what grandma done or what aunt or uncle done or, or your family or your friends or your neighbors in your neighborhood are doing. If it's not true worship in spirit and in truth, God's not pleased with it. Hezekiah acknowledged this. No matter how evil his daddy was, Hezekiah said, no, I know something's wrong here. I must seek after the Lord my God and I want things to go properly for my nation as a leader. Man, what a godly leader Hezekiah was, guys. And to think if we had people in high places that were godly leaders like this man, our nation wouldn't be in turmoil tonight, guys. I promise you that. Amen. 
If we had godly leaders like this in our Congress and in our government, oh man, what a difference it would make, guys. Hezekiah, not like his father before him, he was bound and determined to worship the Lord properly. Down with the status quo worship. Down with the Baal worship, he said. Down with, I, I, I'm not going to do like my father did and th put my kids in the fire and sacrifice my children to a false god named Molech. You know, I would to God there'd be some leaders and some people in this last day. Children of God, you are leaders in this society that we live in. We're a light. We're the light of the world. We're a city set on the hill that cannot be hid. We're, we need to rise up and say, we're tired of you passing our sons and daughters through the fire. We're tired of all the abominations in our land. Man, I'm just going to have to preach to you here for a second. Just, just bear with me. We'll get back to teaching. <laughs> we're tired of the abominations in our land. We're tired of the abortion rate being what it is. We're tired of the divorce rate of what it is. We're tired of the drugs and the alcohol. We're tired of the profanity and the perverseness. We're sick and tired of it, I would to God, I'd get, get a group of a ch children of God in the body of Christ that would be a Hezekiah and stand with me and say that my house is going to serve the Lord and we're going to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. We'll have no other gods before you. We cast down our idols. We cast down anything that stands in the way of our service to our King and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we want to worship Him and Him alone. Oh man, God give us such a people in this last day to cast down the idols that plague our civilization right now. This is what Hezekiah done, guys. This is true worship. Getting rid of anything that hinders you from service, serving God and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Not putting anything ahead of God. Hezekiah cleaned house. Maybe it's time we clean some house. Maybe it's time we need to clean up things in our life. Maybe we need to allow God to come down and deal with us. Maybe we need, we need to not just seek the hand of God. And just wanting the blessings of God, what's in His hand. But maybe to seek the face of God and see if God's displeased or if He's happy with us. Oh, there's a big difference between seeking the hand of God and the face of God. Another sermon for another time, guys. But we need to seek God's face to see how He feels about what's going on in our little world, okay? But he, hey, Hezekiah said, no more status quo worship. Daddy might have done things this way, but this old boy ain't going to do it that way. We're going to serve the Lord. Amen. We're going to serve God. So Hezekiah is bound and determined to worship God. He's bound and determined to give God absolute honor and praise. He's got to clean the kingdom up. These people have been so far away from God. The priests aren't sanctified. The, the preachers are preaching false doctrine. They're false prophesying. The, the Levites haven't sanctified themselves. Nobody's uh, keeping the Passover, which we're going to talk about in just a few moments, how he restored worship. Nobody's worshiping the true living God. God's not getting his. Therefore, the nation of Israel was not blessed. And I'm going to tell you tonight, guys, America is not giving God the praise anymore. America is not worshiping God in spirit and in truth like she has in the past. And God's displeased with it tonight. We've got to turn our hearts from repentance back to God once again like Hezekiah did. Second point I want to throw out about King Hezekiah and how he was set apart by his worship and his devotion to God. Hezekiah knew that out of worship couldn't hold water nor could it quench the thirst in a personal soul. Well, that's worth repeating. Did you catch what I said? King Hezekiah knew that idolatry worship, worshiping other gods, couldn't hold water. You ever heard that terminology? Couldn't hold water, nor quench the thirst in a man or woman's soul. It, it don't hold water. It leaves you empty. Amen? The writing was on the wall, and Hezekiah could read it. Guys, there's writing on the wall tonight. There's trouble in the land. Who's going to read the writing on the wall like Daniel did with Belshazzar in the book of Daniel? The writing's on the wall. Who's going to read it? He, Hezekiah just didn't say, oh yeah, we got problems and you know, it's, it's bad in America today. You know, it's bad in Israel today. No, he didn't do that. He'd done something about it, uh, about the downfall of his nation. He didn't want to see his nation crumble. He didn't want to see them forsake God. I don't want the church to forsake God no longer. I don't want our nation to forsake the Lord our God. God has blessed America. No longer are we crying out, God bless America. We're crying out, God help America. We need the help of God like never before, guys. I want you to look at how he rid, how, how he rid the kingdom of idolatry. It said he tore down the altars of Baal, that false god that everybody served back then. 
and he knew that, that he had to tear down the brazen serpent as well. Now, I want to talk about this brazen serpent. Uh, the brazen serpent, and I believe you'll find it in Numbers. I believe it's chapter number 21. I don't have it in front of me if my memory serves me, serves me correctly. Numbers 21 says that the, the children of Israel murmured and complained against Moses and Aaron. They said, my God, would to God we was back in Egypt. You know, they kept saying that over and over again. We don't have no water. We don't have no bread. All we've got is this little stuff called manna. We're sick of it. And God heard them murmuring and complaining. And he sent fiery serpents among them. They, they, they were smitten with them. They, they were being bit by them. And, and Moses prayed and they cried out to the Lord. And God told Moses, he said, uh, he said if you want healing for the people, you go and erect a, a brazen, a bronze, a bronze, copper, brass serpent. You know, they had, had that new materials there. He said, go and erect that serpent. Make it, make it like an image of a snake. And go and lift it up on a pole real high. And he said, all that look to that serpent, they'll be healed and they'll live. Because, because I'm going to look, look at, they're going to serve me and realize who's done this to them, sending those fiery serpents. And all that look to that brazen serpent, they lived. Well, Jesus talks about it in John chapter number 3. He says, So as Moses has lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and all that looked to it live, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up also. And you can read about that in John chapter number 3 as well. This was a miraculous healing. This was a healing and mercy that come forth to the children of Israel as they're there uh, dying in the wilderness from the fiery serpents. But they looked to that brazen serpent. They obeyed God by looking to it. They'd be healed and they'd live. Well, they still had this brazen serpent, guys, this, this bronze serpent. It was there, but <laughs> this is terrible. They were worshiping the serpent. They were offering up burnt offerings and sacrifices to this serpent instead of God Jehovah. They were worshiping the things that he'd done. They were worshiping that, that, that healing and that blessing, that miracle, when they weren't even worshiping the God that sent all that. Now, you see how this has got to drive God nuts. <laughs> so... Hezekiah has to take down the brazen serpent. He knew that Israel had become delusional and even worshiping it, with, with worshiping that blessing, that miraculous past of God instead of God that sent it. Notice how he, he called the brazen serpent Nehushtan. That, that Nehushtan in the Hebrew means brass or something made of copper. He called it by the material name the material that it was, the copper, the brass. He caught it by material, so to put emphasis on it, uh, just being that and not a God to worship. It was a material. This is uh, this once is, is, is a great reminder of, uh, of God's healing. This was a reminder of God's healing and His mercy, what it once was in the wilderness. But it became an image for them to worship. Hezekiah knew that it had to go. Hezekiah tore it down, ground it up in powder, whatever he'd done, he destroyed it. Psalms 115.4 says this. Listen to this scripture. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths. Talking about the, the heathen's gods, okay? Their idols are silver and gold and the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They made them, they that made them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. Talking about idols made with man's hands. They're made after an imperfect man. They can't speak, they can't hear, they can't answer your prayer. It's sad to say most of the world steeped in idolatry today, and it's sad to say America is as well. And Lord willing, we'll get on a series on that later on. Amen. But we're steeped in idolatry today. We've replaced the glory of God that's supposed to be in our lives. And we've supplemented with that that is false. And we're chasing after the wrong thing. when we should be chasing after God. Hezekiah knew that these false gods wouldn't hold water. He knew they wouldn't quench the thirsty soul. And he said they have to go. He cleaned the house, guys. Amen. Maybe we need to clean some house and get rid of the idols in our lives as well. When we do, proper worship will go up unto God. I want to talk about this last point. We'll come to a conclusion here. Hezekiah had to deal with counterfeit gods. Mm. He had to deal 
with counterfeit gods. Just as with counterfeit goods or money, you know, things are counterfeit nowadays. You, you got the real and you got the fake. So just as counterfeit goods or money, the best way to recognize and rid the kingdom of counterfeit gods, Hezekiah knew they needed to spend time with the real thing. They needed to have the real deal. That's what Hezekiah was after and how he wanted to get the people's hearts to turn towards God. And listen how he spent time with them. But, but think about this in an example. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Think about it. a bank. They, they don't spend a lot of time letting their bank tellers, those that handle the money, handle counterfeit bills and currency. No, they let them handle the real bills enough to know what it should always feel and look like. Guys, if we, if we get a hold of God once again and get in the presence of God, there wasn't nothing to turn our head. There wasn't nothing to turn, turn us aside. We wouldn't fall into the temptation of Satan himself, and we'd serve the one true living God. Hezekiah knew how to deal with these counterfeit gods. Get them out of the way and let them handle the real thing. Let them handle the real deal. That's what Hezekiah had done. And, and you'll find this, it chronicalizes it better in 2 Chronicles around chapter number 30. He called all the tribes of Israel together. He called the, the people around and said, look, we're going to keep the Passover. They've not kept the Passover. What, they were, what God had instituted them to keep for perpetually, they, didn't, they haven't been even doing the Passover. They ain't been doing sacrifices. They ain't been worshiping in the temple like they should. Everything's been getting over to idolatry, but Hezekiah's cleaning up. So he goes and he assembles and calls out the tribes to come and to keep the Passover. And you'll find that in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and 30. That's a good text to read on this. He fully restores temple worship and calls the people to keep the Passover. And there was such joy in keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread with the Passover. You know, you'd look back in the Old Testament to keep it seven days. They were to have no leavened bread. They were just to have unleavened bread seven days as they worshiped the Lord. But I want, I want to point out to, to you what happened in 2 Chronicles 30. 23. It says the whole assembly took counsel to keep other seven days and they kept other seven days with gladness. What just happened there? They, they kept the seven days of unleavened bread, but they consented all together as an assembly to go seven more days and just praise and worship God because they were so glad that God was going to bless their nation once again. Dear God, they didn't want church to be over with. They didn't want it to end. They didn't want prayer meeting to be over with. They didn't want worship to go away. They wanted to keep singing the songs of Zion. They wanted to keep worshiping with the Levites. And they wanted the priests to keep offering up sacrifice. They wanted to keep there, amen, at God's place and God's temple so God would bless them. I'm going to tell you guys this, guys. This is how we deal with the counterfeit. You get in the presence of God and you handle the real stuff, you won't want what the devil's got to throw at you. You won't want a false prophet to come lie to you. You'll, you'll see it and you'll, you'll smell it. You'll know it when it comes around you when you've had the real deal. You'll know what, what is not the Holy Ghost and you'll know what the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost is with somebody. You'll know who is of Jesus and who's not of Jesus. You'll know when the devil walks into the room if you handle the real stuff long enough. Praise God. Hezekiah knew how to deal with the counterfeit. My question to you is, do you know how to deal with the counterfeit in this last day? My God, get set apart by worship. You get in the presence of God long enough, God will teach you what you need to know. Praise the Lamb of God. Oh, I feel Him taping this to you. Amen. And doing this Bible devotion with you. I feel Him in this room right now. Praise God. When proper worship is restored, then nobody will want it to end. Don't you just love those church services? If you've never been in one Dear God, come on out to welcome. We're looking to have plenty of them. Where you've been there for two or three hours and you've been worshiping God, you forget about everything else going on in this whole rotten world, and, and you're there, and, and you've just been praising God. The singers are getting weary. Piano players' fingers are hurting. The singers, are, their throats are getting dried out. But people are still praising and worshiping. Spirit of God's falling on people. People getting delivered. People getting saved. People getting a touch from the Holy Ghost. I mean, God's just moving in His presence. I mean, it's like a wave of glory that hits you when that comes down. Oh, to be in God's presence. When proper worship is restored, then nobody will want to go to the house. And nobody will want it to end. Praise God. You, don't, you won't even want to come out of your prayer closet when proper worship's in there. They went from not keeping the feast for years on end to not wanting the feast to end. Oh, praise the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So in conclusion to this, 
through the study of kings and prophets, we've talked about the great people of God, guys. Man, we've talked about Elijah, Elisha. We've talked about the King Solomon. We've talked about King Saul. We've talked about all kinds of kings and prophets through this. You know, but they're, they're just people. They're not the Lord. Hmm. Kings are just people that will let us down. After all, they're just humans, right? Just like me and you. But there's a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords, guys, that will never fail us and never disappoint us like an earthly king will. Oh, hallelujah. He is the perfect king and is the only one worthy of the worship, honor, and glory, and praise. That is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the one true God. Hallelujah. He's not just my Savior, but He is my King. Praise God. And if He is my King, then I'll be a part of His kingdom, and all my reverence and devotion must be given unto Him. And He must be first in my life. That's why God said in Exodus 34, 14, For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. You know why He called Himself a jealous God? Because He don't want to share you with nobody else. He wants to be your God. He wants to be your Father. He wants to be your King, your Lord, your Master, your Savior, your Redeemer, and your Healer. You know, guys, God is a jealous God, though. He loves you with an everlasting love. I love you too, and I hope you give Him all the worship, all the praise that belongs unto Him. Be set apart by your worship. Amen. I want to pray with you and leave you with this prayer tonight that, that God will be number one of your life. I hope He's number one to you. If He's not, that means He's secondary, and He's not going to be second to none. Okay, guys? So give Him all your praise, all the worship that you can give Him, and let Him bless you. Father, we well, love you tonight, and I praise you for all those that have watched this evening. I pray that you be with them, lead them, and guide them. God bless us all that we be set apart by our worship and our devotion unto you. I pray that we've all learned some valuable lessons tonight. Bless us, God, and touch our people, Lord, that have watched this this evening. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.